Hi and welcome to the Science in the News lecture series. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes with the third lecture of this nine-part series titled Inputs and Outputs, How the Brain Allows Us to Interact with the World. Answering any questions you might have oh, um, over the good food and beer that they have in the program. 
Um, so check that out. The next one we have is this coming Monday, uh, Columbus Day, with Dr. Nikhil Nayar on engineering new my microbial life forms. And that will be at 7 p.m. Um, so in addition to science of the kind, we also have an online presence and we have a blog called Signal to Noise where graduate students post articles that um, are on various different science topics ranging from physics to biology to biomedical research. So um, I encourage you to check that out. That's on our website. Uh, so Vinny's going to talk about tonight's work. All right, so it's good to see a lot of familiar faces, like Kelsey said, but for those of you who are newcomers today, uh, the way each of our lectures work is tonight we actually have two different two speakers, Laura and Shay, who will be telling you a little bit about how the brain works. And between the two lectures, two uh, separate lecture portions, there will be a short intermission. So as Laura and Shay are giving their lecture, they'll pause at uh, strategic points to uh, ask for questions that you may have. So we ask that you hold all of your questions up until that point. And the other thing you'll notice is that they repeat the question that you ask them. And this is because we have some people watching the live stream below. Uh, and this is so they can actually hear the questions that the audience members ask. Um, the other thing uh, for you guys, I know we ran out of handouts, but uh, for those of you who did receive handouts, we have um, a sheet of turns, a lot of turns on the back that will help you uh, understand the text a little bit better, and also some of our upcoming texts as well. And we also have these handy dandy surveys. So if you are regular, uh, then you will have seen these before. These surveys are for us to be able to make these lectures better. Uh, get feedback to understand what you like, what you didn't like, for the speakers to improve themselves, and also if there are uh, topics in the future that you'd like to hear about, we'd love to hear about that as well. So, with that, without further ado, um, actually, so one thing we forgot to mention is um, at the end of this lecture, we will have lab tour of Dr. Nikhil Nayar's lab. So, if you guys want to come and see that, that will be a great way to get to know him a little bit better. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and Shay to talk about their work and what they're doing for our lecture tonight. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Shay. Thank you, Shay. Shay will talk a little bit about 
how sometimes that can fail. And with a better understanding of the nervous system, you can understand better how this can fail. Uh, so most of you know that your brain and your spinal cord play a central part of your nervous system. They make up the central nervous system. But you actually have neurons throughout your entire body. And these neurons in the periphery uh, make up the peripheral nervous system. And so all of the senses that you experience are coming from neurons that are in this periphery, and they're sending information to the brain. So senses come from the periphery, they go to the brain, the brain does some type of conversation. <laughs> And uh, sometimes it will make the decision to produce some type of action. And this message is sent out through the peripheral nervous system to the muscles. So sometimes the brain decides to make an action. Okay, but why do we have a nervous system? Why would you even want a nervous system? Why would you want to be able to do this? Well, the ability to sense things in our environment and react to them allow us to do things like find food, and escape from predators and find a mate. Uh, almost like find a mate. So it seems pretty evolutionarily beneficial to have these things. Uh, our nervous system allows us in some to interact with the world. It's a great thing. And all of this is possible because of these guys, neurons. They're beautiful. And not only are they beautiful, but they give you the ability to see and to feel and to think and to remember things and to even move your body through the world. They have a lot of great abilities. And so we'll go through this a little bit and explain to you how we start on to do this. So, okay, go back for the evening. I'm going to be talking all about sensation. Uh, by the time we get to the end, I'll be able to show you some demos of like visual illusions. And you'll be able to understand them with your new knowledge of how the nervous system works. <laughs> and uh, then we'll have a short break and uh, there are snacks and you can come down and ask me more questions then. And then Shay will talk about the behavioral system and then go afterwards, etc. Um, all right, so let's get started. How do our senses work? Well, the first thing you need to know is that all information that your body can process at some point is in the form of electricity. There's an electrical signal in your body, the same type of electricity that you get from an outlet and you plug in your computer or your phone, that same type of electricity is happening in your nerves, in your brain right now. And so all sensation has to occur by some physical phenomenon in the environment being converted into an electrical signal. Okay, so let's think about that. For each one of the five senses, what is the physical phenomena in the environment that you have to be able to sense? So, for example, for vision, what do you need to see? Light on. Light, exactly. Uh, so, for you to be able to see anything, a photon of light is actually hitting a neuron in your eye. It's touching your eye and interacting with the receptor, the light, in a neuron in your eye. Okay, next sense, touch. Touch and audition are actually the same thing, although I gave you So yeah, pressure. Audition is just the pressure of sound waves coming in and hitting your ear. So the pressure from the sound waves on a neuron in your ear is making it have some electrical signal. The same thing is true for touch. Okay, I won't give this one away. What's taste and smell? Molecular recognition. Molecular, yeah. So molecules from your environment are actually <laughs> coming off the thing that you're smelling or tasting and binding to a receptor in a neuron in your nose or in your mouth. And that is what you are experiencing when you experience taste or smell. So you can think about that next time you drive past a field of cows on the side of the road and you smell something bad, you know, it's in your nose. <laughs> okay. okay, but how can all these physical things be converted into electrical information? It seems crazy, right? <laughs> well, before I can tell you, I need to back up a little bit and tell you a little bit more about a neuron. So a neuron is just a specialized cell that uses electrical signals to send and receive information. And this is an image of another image of what a neuron looks like. Uh, let's talk about the anatomy of this neuron a little bit. So the dendrites are the part that receive information 
and they tend to be near the cell body, but the shape of all neurons are different. Um, and then the cell body has all the regular things that cells in your body have. Uh, there's a nucleus with DNA, etc. And then the axon is what sends the information down the line to the next neuron or possibly a muscle that it synapses onto. Synapses a connection between neurons. Yes. Hydroelectrodes. Hydroelectrodes. What do you mean? Well, so the electricity in your brain is just charges moving. And so any time that charges move, that's producing electrical current. And so it's the same type of thing that is in wire that you like, have for a cord. When you plug it into the wall, we have uh, charges that are moving in that wire and that's providing you electricity. But there will be a lot of other repercussions, so let's wait for this. Okay, and so now we know the anatomy of the cell, the axon is what sends the information, and all of this is possible because of an electrical imbalance across the cell membrane. And so maybe this will get a little bit more to the point of your question. So let's talk about this electrical imbalance. This is actually how the cell spends the most of its energy. It's constantly working hard to pump out all these positive charges across the cell membrane. So charges can't simply move across the cell membrane, but there are pumps that require energy to shoot those charges out. But then, so the cell is working so hard to create this electrical imbalance where there's a positive environment outside the cell compared to um, a comparatively negative charge inside the cell. So that at moment's notice, it can just open pores in the membrane and the charges can diffuse into the cell. Like so. And this is the same process by which ink diffuses in a glass, just regular diffusion. And so when the pores open up, the cell allows charge to move into the, into the cell, and it, there becomes a more positive environment inside the cell. And so you can think of this as the basic unit of information in your brain. You have either an active cell or a not active cell. And so when you think of the basic unit of information, like in computers, you can have a one or a zero. And using ones and zeros, you can encode all these things with like the internet. <laughs> and so we use active and not active cells to encode all the information in our brains. Alright, so that's just how one cell can encode information. But how does this information get passed from one cell to the next? Well, I talked about the structure of a cell. It has dendrites that receive information and then an axon that sends that information down the line. And cells can be connected to a lot of cells. But here's just one cell that's downstream of the original neuron. And there's a point where the axon of this upstream neuron will meet the dendrites of the downstream neuron. So let's zoom in on that spot. And so I keep using the word connected, they're connected to each other, but they're actually not, they don't need to touch. So this is the tip of the axon of the upstream cell, and here's the end of, of the dendrite of the downstream cell, and there's this gap between the two. And this gap is called the synapse. Um, and so in the axon of the upstream cell, there are these small little chemicals that are just waiting to get a message from that cell when it's active. And there are these receptors on the downstream cell that can bind to those chemicals that are in the upstream axon. And so when the upstream cell becomes active, the charge moves like a wave down the axon and reaches the end of the terminal. And when that charge gets to the axon terminal, it causes the release of these little chemicals. And when the chemicals are released into the synapse, some of them combine to the receptor. And the signal continues down to the next cell by combining the these uh, chemicals, either causing opening or closing of pores in the next cell down the line. And so these little chemicals are called neurotransmitters. Neuro for neuron transmitters because they're transmitting information and the receptors are receiving that information. So you may be familiar.
familiar with some neurotransmitters. There are a few very popular ones. <laughs> <laughs> Serotonin and dopamine are very famous. But GABA and glutamate are actually the most common neurotransmitters in your brain. And there's, so there's an advantage to using these little chemicals to transmit information between cells because you can do all sorts of complicated things. Like GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So when GABA binds to receptors on the downstream neuron, it makes the cell quiet. It's not active. But when glutamate binds to the downstream receptors, it increases activity in the cell. And so this is just a short list of neurotransmitters. You have a ton more of them. They can all be different types of things. Um, but yeah, so uh, glutamate with open pores in the downstream neuron, causing charges to move in and make the inside of the cell more active, more positive, whereas GABA would close those pores, making the cell less active. All right, so I just told you about six months worth of neuroscience and an intro to neuroscience. <laughs> uh, so let's review. The nervous system allows us to experience and interact with the world. And I told you a little bit about neurons. Neurons are specialized cells that carry information via electricity but they communicate with each other using chemical signals, mostly. There's a few synapses that have electrical signals, but I won't talk about those. All right, so any questions? Yeah. I've never, I've never seen this one by accident <laughs> and and they like that's a great question, and it is true. There are axon axonal connections between cells. Um, a cell can even make a connection onto itself. Great question. Dendrite, um, dendrite, I don't know how that would work actually, because it would be two receiving ends. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really get to that question, to be honest. You know, that's not when we have a neuroscience group back there. Dendrite, dendrite connections? Stan says yes. The retina. Yes. It's true. Yeah. So the neurons, like the axons, never really touch. It's just the. Uh, right. Um, there's a there's a gap. It's called the synaptic cleft, and it's a gap where the neurotransmitters can be released into, and then there will be some probability of those chemicals binding to the receptors. Yeah. Are there any uh, chances that the chemicals don't bind to the receptors? Yeah. Like they just float out of the. Uh, yeah. Do that's those, true. Do those chemicals can they attach to different receptors on different neurons? Yeah. So the receptors don't have to be like perfectly lined in the. They, there can be some flow on the sides. And yeah, exactly what you said. Oh, sorry. Just keep repeating your question. So the question was that uh, if you have chemicals that are being released into one synapse, can they bind to another synapse? And the answer is yes. And there's also uh, support uh, support cells around the neurons that can take up those neurotransmitters and prevent them from binding to other cells or prevent them from staying into the synaptic left to bind to receptors later on. Um, there's all sorts of complex machinery to deal with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The synapses are caused by chemicals. What if you run out of the chemicals? That is a really great question. Okay, so if, if the synapse doesn't have any more of those chemicals and you get activity in that cell, but there's nothing to release, what happens? And I think Shay will address that more when he's talking about Parkinson's disease. Um, so maybe I'll save that one for him. Yeah. Right. Are these neurons created? Is it like the is it just looking at the or the other magnetic and like what creates these magnetic pulses? Are they created? How are how are the sorry, how is the original like calls the the uh like magnetic charge, how is it created? So the so the charge is coming from ions. Which are just like sodium and potassium and chloride, and these are just uh, ions that are in your body, and so they're moving across the cell membrane because of this gradient. Um, they're moving through diffusion, um, and they're in your body just in the same way that I don't know you have like protein in your body, so you're eating and drinking. Okay. 
think that was a good answer. <laughs> Of 
bright band inside ring of the flower that could sort of look like a bullseye and maybe draw the bee or hummingbird, which can also see you be like to the pollen of the flower. So this is an additional piece of information that these animals are getting from the environment that we just can't sense because we don't have a receptor for it. But there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to. And that extends to other things like magnetism or x-rays or other things. So it's like you can only sense it if you have a receptor for that physical thing. But just not with all the other physical things in this room right now, then we just can't detect when you just think there's nothing there. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but we're still talking about vision. So I told you a little bit about those photoreceptors in your eye. They're back here, and this is the retina. And so when light comes into your eye, uh, you're seeing an object. It's, it goes through the lens of your eye and actually gets reflected in a way that is upside down, upside down in the back of your eye. But that's not that important. The point I'm trying to make for this slide is that when light is coming in, it's hitting the back of your eye in a particular place, and that allow, and, and in that place, these photoreceptors are receiving the light that allow you to see that object. And so there needs to be photoreceptors that are collecting the light to allow you to see the object. But there's this weird spot on the back of your eye, right here. Does anyone know what this is? Why do you need to have this spot here? Yeah. Exactly, it goes to the brain. You need to get that information out of your eye somehow. So this is the highway out of the eye. It goes to the brain and eventually tells the brain that there's a tree here. But this is the highway where all the axons are passing through. You can't have any photoreceptors here because there's no space. It's where they all have to leave. It's the exit route. So nothing can, no photoreceptors can exist right there. So you can't sense anything right there. You can't see anything right there. But that doesn't make any sense, right? Like we're looking around this room right now. I don't see like a spot in my vision that I'm blind in. Even if I close one eye, I can see all of you. I can see everything. There's no blind spot. That doesn't make any sense. Well. I'm going to show you that's a bad assumption. <laughs> so, everyone has this uh, on their hand out. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, everyone's so like, sharing your neighbors if you don't have one. Uh, so, follow these instructions. Hold it in about all the experience. If they actually did it for years since last time I was there, so I'm making arm good. Cover your. Is that right? I think it should be that bad. It should be the eye from the plus sign. The eye on the same side of the plus sign? Yes. Yeah. It's left. Okay. Um, and then hold the image, slowly move it closer to you until the cow disappears. And you may have to like move it back and forth a little bit to try and like get it in the right spot. But there's a particular spot that you put it in where all of a sudden it turns <laughs> Moving to still see it, 
And then, so as you're focusing on that plus sign, your eyes are moving around, your other eyes closed. As soon as you get the cow into the part of your visual field that the light is hitting that part of your eye where there are no photoreceptors, all of a sudden it just disappears because you have no photoreceptors that are sensing it anymore. But this is not the only part of the back of your eye where there's an uneven distribution of photoreceptors. So we're going to be talking about photoreceptors as like an overall big picture thing that are all sensing light. But you have different photoreceptors that sense different types of light. So you have some photoreceptors that, all, that can sense all wavelengths of light. Those are called rods. They cannot distinguish different colors. Cones are photoreceptors that distinguish different types of wavelengths of light because there's only specific wavelengths of light that will, that will change the structure of that molecule resting in the photoreceptor. And so they can distinguish between three different colors of light based on their three different types of cones, based on their three different types of molecules that are being activated by light. And so if you only have your color blind, you only have two of those photoreceptors. You can, you can distinguish small, like a, a less wide range of light. Okay, but so now cones. Cones are the only thing that allows us to see color. But based on this, okay, so this is the y-axis, it's just uh, the around the back of your eye, your blind spot. We just demonstrated that's where there's no photoreceptors. So here we're looking at the number of cells, the number of photoreceptors per square uh, millimeter. So you see this one spot where there are no photoreceptors. But then there's also this other interesting spot where basically all of your cones are. You have a small number of cones outside of that area, but most of your cones are only in this one spot of your visual field. That doesn't really make very much sense, right? Because when you look around this whole room, you see so much color everywhere. You see color around the whole periphery. It's not like you're only seeing it at one point. Well, that's not true either. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone focus on this red plus sign in the center of the image. And I'm going to put up another image, but concentrate on the red plus sign. Don't look away from the red plus sign. Keep staring at the red plus sign. <laughs> Everyone still staring at the red plus sign? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now you can look away. Oh, I see. Oh, oh. I see it. <laughs> oh, oh. You can look back at the red plus sign. No, this is where you're going. Why did that happen? Oh. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> why? Why do we see color all around us all the time? But we couldn't see it just then. It's like it's because your eyes were focused on one point and you weren't moving your eyes around. The reason why you see color in the whole room is because your eyes are actually involuntarily darting around the entire room, collecting information and creating this mental image for you of what's happening in the room around you. And when something moves in the corner of your eye, your eyes will involuntarily move towards that moving thing to collect the new information. And when you see something with fine detail, like on someone's face, you focus on those fine details to collect all that information. And when you have a spot where there's less information, your eyes spend less time there because there's less information to collect. So when you look at this image of this face, you're not just looking at the whole image at once and taking it all in as like one big mental image at a time. Your eyes are actually darting around the whole image and you have no control over it. So when you look at this image, if I were to track where your eyes were looking, it would look something like this. <laughs> so your eyes, your eyes focus on her eyes and her nose and her mouth because that's where they, they need to spend the most time to collect all the information. And then they spend less time in like her forehead and her teeth because yeah, 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 you just need to start there once and you got it. So, all right. We have multiple specialized receptors for each sense. Uh, when the receptors are activated, pores in the membrane open or close, creating an active or not active cell. And our sensory experience is incomplete and sometimes inaccurate. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Variability across the entirety of the universe. Yeah. You're saying these things as if everyone has the same degree of, uh, of accuracy or inaccuracy. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. 
And this is actually, so I have one more slide after this, and it's all about how experience can change our ability to sense things. But in addition to that, some people have four photoreceptors. Instead, or no, cones plus, sorry, sorry, one rod, one type of rod plus four different types of cones, whereas most of us have three different types of cones because they can see two different types of red. So, and that's only women can have that because it's excellent. So, so sometimes if you meet a woman who is, has very strong opinion about different types of red or <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the size of the moon illusion, I always thought we called it an illusion because whether the moon was high or the moon was low, the light, the photons from the moon were hitting about the same amount of retina, right? Except that when it's low, your brain says, oh, that's a big deal. You were showing us pictures yeah. from a camera, yeah. right? You take the pixels out, there are many more pixels for the low moon than there is for the high moon. Mm -hmm. The camera doesn't have a brain. Yeah. Why is that an illusion? So, Okay, so I think the explanation for why the moon said the moon, so I, I have to say, I didn't directly explain why the moon illusion works because there isn't like a really great consensus on it, like it isn't definitely the truth. But I'm really into illusions and I've read a lot about the illusion. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what I have to take away from the illusion is that, uh, so, you the blind spot in the back of your eye. You have to send all the information out of your eye into your brain. So, your eye, all nerve, there's many more neurons than just photoreceptor neurons in the back of your eye. There's lots of layers of, of different neurons that are kind of summing up what's going on to try and condense the amount, the number of axons that have to leave the back of your eye to make the blind spot basically as small as possible. So all those summations that are happening in the back of your eye are all size comparisons and brightness comparisons, and this is how most visual illusions work, is by showing you, you know, two of the same color objects, but surrounded by different things, or two of the same size things, but surrounded by different size things, and your brain is making those comparisons and like summing things up and trying to tell you things about size that can send out to, the, to your brain. So look at the illusion. You have the moon really low in the sky. You have the same size object surrounded by everything that's really tiny on the horizon. And so comparatively, it makes the moon look huge. Whereas when the moon is really high in the sky, there's nothing around it. There's just this vast space that looks much small compared to everything else. Or small. But I have to say, there isn't a consensus on why that works, and that was just one that I liked the best. <laughs> you can talk around. Actually, the camera wasn't filmed, though. Yeah. So the illusion comes from not inside your head, but outside, like what you see outside around well, the object? So, yeah, well, so the, the neurons in your periphery, the neurons in your eyes, still make a part of your nervous system, and they're still doing computations that are like similar to computations that happen in your brain. Um, and it's always part of your brain in a way. Um, it's not it's not the moon that's physically changing the size, it's like the way you're interpreting the size of the moon is what's wrong. You have a question. Uh, how are we able to tell what ultraviolet light looks like? That was a picture taken with a camera that has a filter for this ultraviolet light. So Humans have this great ability to detect way, way more things than we can actually physically sense because we can build objects that can sense them for us. Yeah? When you said, like, our eyes are like the
Uh, one more question. Someone who hasn't asked yet. Yeah. I was just curious about Morris offering. Is it the same in all individuals? Or what does it look like? That's a good question. So I what was the question? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think I was going to ask about what you're Okay, um, so the question was uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, what does the membrane of these cells look like? And is it the same for all cells or all? Okay, well, so I had a picture um, in a protein version structure. Of the receptor sitting in the membrane. So, this is what all membranes look like, all cell membranes look like. There's lots of things in the membrane, like other proteins. Um, and those pores that I was, talk I was talking about, that's another protein that sits in the membrane. But the basic structure of a protein are uh, is, is this structure where the, the ends, these red dots, um, are charged. So they have a they, so I have to, I have to explain um, whether things are hydrophilic or hydrophobic <laughs> to describe a membrane, right? This might be a big rabbit hole. So, <laughs> but, so but the things in the middle of the membrane don't like charges. Charges can't come in there. And so the only way a charge can move through a membrane is if there's some structure that is holding it and protecting it from this area that doesn't like charge. And so, yes, the, pro the, the membrane of all these different types of cells, this part of the, the structure is the same, but there's all these different types of proteins that are in that membrane that's different for different cells. Okay, um, I just have one more slide, actually, and, um, and I can stop and we'll break and Jane can come up here and wow, you guys. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, and it's really more of a point, a general point. So all the illusions that I've shown you, that I've shown you so far have all been some sort of physical organization of your nervous system that just happens based on the way the neurons are set up. But there's actually another huge contribution to your sensation of your environment is the experiences that you've gone through in your life. It actually changes your senses. So this is uh, answering a question you brought up. So here's an experiment that demonstrates that, and there's a bunch more. But here's one example. So in this study, researchers looked at the area in the brain that was associated with uh, the subject being able to, so they took a subject and they touched each one of the five digits on the left hand, and they looked at the area of the brain that was sensing that, that, could, that was responding to those touches on each one of the five digits. And they found that the area on the left hand of string instrument players was much larger than the area in people who didn't play an instrument. And so the whole reason why they were looking at players of string instruments is for not to play string instrument. You have to have major dexterity in your left hand to be able to control it quickly and carefully and put it on the right string. Um, and so they actually have a greater ability to sense things with their left hand than they do with their right hand, and a greater ability to sense things with their left hand than uh, controls that don't play an instrument. And this ability was uh, affected by the age of when they started playing musical instruments. So when the patient or the subject started playing musical instrument by the age of five, it actually had a, a much greater effect on the area devoted to their left hand sensation and control compared to those who never played a string instrument. And this has also been shown for blind people who can read in braille, the area in the brain on their on the pointer, uh, their index finger was much enlarged than their in their brain. So this demonstrates that your experiences that you go through in your world actually change your brain and change your ability to sense things in the world. And that's it for Right, and then left. And Laura and Shay will be down here for questions. And if you 
you'd like to slide up for the lab floor, please see Catherine over here. Uh, I put them out.
Okay, I'm gonna testing, 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 okay. Testing, 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 sound, testing, sound, testing, 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 sound, 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 <laughs> testing, sound, testing, testing, sound more. You don't hear it. It's the USB.
And this shows that it was not by the intervention of our soul that they closed, seeing that it is against our will, but it is because the machine of our body is so formed that the movement of this hand towards our eyes excites another movement in our brain, which conducts the animal spirits into the muscles and causes the eyes to be closed. <laughs> so, and also, they're not actually took the public stand to stand. <laughs> um, and, so I think we can agree, right, that you didn't get it all right. right? There are some <laughs> incorrect assumptions here. But let's give you some slack, right? The year is 1649. This is 150 years, or at least 100 years before we were able to do anything with electricity at all. Right? And it's 200 years before we start to suspect that electricity is actually in our bodies. So before that, the prevailing hypothesis was that your brain was there to house your soul. And that your soul was your volition and your will, and it would decide what you wanted to do. And once it decided, or you had decided, it would inform the animal spirits, and they would flow down your nerves and contract your muscles. And that's how you behave. So if we just pretend for a moment that's true. He yeah, actually says some pretty insightful things. He said a reflex is different because it's against our will. It's involuntary. And then it happens because the machine of our body is so formed. It's just the way that we're put together that causes a reflex to happen. And this um, is generally true, right? So when we think of a reflex, now we know it to be a behavior that really doesn't involve the brain, but that it occurs when a sensation comes in and turns right back around the spinal cord before going up and causes a, uh, a behavior. So what's an example other than a blink of a reflex that most people know about? The knee jerk, yeah, so popular that it's part of our vernacular, right? Do a knee jerk reaction to a behavior that you do before you really think about. So we usually experience the knee jerk reflex at a doctor's office, right? When a doctor takes a hopefully small hammer and <laughs> you blow the knee. What that's doing is it's exciting a sensory neuron in the periphery, right? And that causes, uh, it, it has receptors that detect pressure, and it turns that into electricity, and then excites it. And it synapses in the spinal cord directly on a motor neuron. And that motor neuron forms a neuromuscular junction onto the quadriceps muscle, causing it to contract, and your legs to pick up. And so that's really what the knee jerk, or it's called the tele reflex part reflex case, right? It doesn't go to the brain, you don't think about it, you can't control it because it never gets to a part of you that you are able to control. It happens all below your brain. All right, so I told you guys that all behavior is just relaxing and contracting muscles, that muscles are controlled by motor neurons, and the reflexes uh, are reactions to sensations do not involve the brain. Before we get into like more complicated behaviors, are there any questions on this? Yeah. So, is there a qualitative difference between, and if I'm in a doctor's office and he does that, I can, I can freeze my leg. Yeah. I can stop it from moving. Yeah. So, is there a qualitative difference between that and your heart pumping? I can't do that. Oh. Well, <laughs> well, so that's not entirely true, right? People can control their heart rate. People get really good at slowing up and down their heart rate. It's just you can't do it in the same way. Um, your heart is receiving, well, your heart is actually it's a bit of its own energy generator, but it's still receiving information from parts of your brain that, that give information about whether or not you're running really fast and you should speed up or slowing down. But your brain, yeah, so just because, I guess I should, you know, to be totally honest with you, right? <laughs> when, when, you're, when, when the hammer strikes your knee, there are tons of sensory neurons here, some of which are involved in the reflex, and others of which go up to your brain. and but you sense it, right? Because you actually feel it. Right. And you can use that information to <laughs> control other muscles that will freeze your, your leg, right? So you can, and if you know it's coming, you can prepare yourself for the sensation. And so it definitely ways that you can mask the reflex in that way. But you're not changing this, this connection that's causing the reflex. Yeah. yeah. Is that connection intentionally that way, or is it just that that neuron happens to also fire near the muscle? No, this connection is this way, and it's just, I mean, it's a, it's a reflex that's involved, evolves evolutionarily. Uh, I actually tried to figure out why we have such a reflex, and um, it, it wasn't like a super clear answer, but I think the best one is that 
is it's involved in basically uh, kicking your leg back up when you put weight on. So when you're walking down and your your knee bends, you don't want to like fall all the way through. And so your your quadricep tight. You want to take your quadricep to keep yourself upright. And this reflex is involved in knee hack uh, without you having to do a cross. Yeah. So there's only certain reflexes in certain body parts. It's not yeah, yeah. There's only question? certain reflexes. All right, sorry. So the question was: Are there only certain reflexes in certain body parts? And that's correct. Yeah, there are certain there are certain muscles and certain sensory neurons that are hooked up together in the spinal cord that create muscles, but there are parts of your body and sensitive sense that are not involved in reflexes. What does it tell the doctor? When they yeah, great question. So the, the question was, what does it tell the doctor if you can or cannot exhibit this teller reflex? So I looked this up, and the answer was surprisingly unclear. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, this reflex exists. Yeah, this reflex exists, that's for sure. Um, what it tells you is sort of like, oh, well, if you, can't, if you don't have this reflex, it has like, a bunch of things that could be wrong. Right? So it's more like a diagnostic to say, well, something's wrong. Because <laughs> 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 like, well, it means that it's in your eyes, it's in your ears, and you have some spinal cord damage, or there are other things that can damage the response. Um, so I'm not a doctor. I do it on my face. But yeah. I mean, basically, what what. What you're distinguishing in is, is is if there is an absence of it, yeah. or if it's there is a hyper uh, right. reflexive response. You're looking at whether it's upper motor neuron or low, lower motor sure. neuron, yeah. and and so if you if you deal with neurology and you're using it as a diagnostic, it just starts to direct you what part of the nervous system may be damaged or have a deficit. Yeah. Um, or you could even have a herniated disc in your back, sure. and you want to know the severity of the nerve damage. So it, it, it's pretty clear to me when I do this. <laughs> well, but it's not like it doesn't work to me right. specifically. It's just indicative that something is wrong. It can give you some information. So she mentioned like an upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron, and that is basically distinguishes between a neuron coming down from the brain to the spinal cord, and a neuron coming from the spinal cord to the muscle, and it's upper is to the spinal cord, and lower is to the muscle. If somebody sneaks up on you and goes boom, <laughs> okay. and you go like that, is that a reflex? No, I think that, I mean, there might be some startled reflex that might be true, but I mean, reaction, there's a lot of reactions too, right? And reactions are, are fundamentally different than people with the brain. They can be very, very fast, and they can be sort of seemingly involuntary, but you can control them over time, as you said, it's coming up, you sensitize yourself to them. Um, and so distinguishing the two is really hard to do behaviorally. It's something that's really done more by like figuring out the stuff you're asking. Is this a something that goes turning on the spinal cord or not? Yeah, I'll take this one and I'll go out. Uh, what about the Pavlov reflex behavior? Hmm. Yeah, so that's 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 not a reflex. That's just a uh, that's just a very stereotyped mechanism of learning. <laughs> uh, the question is: Is Pavlov's uh, the Pavlov's dogs that learn to start that began to salivate when the dinner bell was rung because they associate the dinner bell with the food of the day? Is that a reflex? Uh, and my answer is: It's not a reflex in this sense. It's a, it's a it's a very stereotyped way of learning, in your, but it's in your brain. Okay, cool. So, all right, so let's move on. Let's move away from reflexes. Most behaviors we do that we care about and are interested in are not reflexes that are incredibly complicated behaviors like speaking and moving your hands and running and pitching ball. And so, how does the brain uh, how does the brain control that? And so, I'm going to take you, I'm going to go back in the street again a little bit because um, it's pretty, uh, the, the study, the story of how we discovered how our brain controls our muscles. Is, is really tied to how you discover how the brain does anything. And, and the, oh, sorry. <laughs> and so the, the, the big question is, how do we get from the animal spirit to electricity? Because to learn anything about the brain, um, beyond studying brain injuries, to start asking what information is, is happening in the brain and how we're processing it, we need to know what that information is, and it's electricity. 
And so if you're trying to study animal spirits, it wouldn't get very far. <laughs> and so, so how do we figure it out? Well, it actually all started in the mid-1700s when the Leyden jar was made. And the Leyden jar was just the first thing that we invented that could hold a charge and then we could walk around with and discard when we wanted to. We could give us shocks. Right? And this actually became super popular, not because it led to the invention of the light bulb right away, but because people thought that it was hugely uh, medically therapeutic. And electroshock therapy, for lack of a better word, became massively popular. Right? It was the cure-all for everything. Doctors would give you 200 shocks, get a fever, and so on and so on. So this led to a lot of interest among scientists to figure out well, what is electricity doing to animals? How does it act on the body? What is it doing? And is it, there was a huge controversy, right? There was like the pro electrotherapy people and the anti ones, and people believe the work, people didn't believe it. And so it led a lot to a lot of science into how electricity works on animals. And this led to the experiment that gave us a clue that electricity is actually in our bodies all the time. And the famous experiment was done by a man named Bill Batman in 1791, and he took, um, uh, frog, and he actually, instead of exciting the muscles, what people can do, people get shocks to the muscles and they would be and that was accepted. It was confused people a little bit, but you know, you could get it, like you jump when you get shot. But he actually touched the electrode that gave the, the electric shock to the spinal cord where the nerves were. And when he did that and he gave a shock, he could see the muscles in the legs. And he made the insightful conclusion that this must mean that electricity is the agent that flows around the nerves and controls our muscles. That by electrically stimulating up here, he was causing information to flow and causing the muscles to contract. Right? This is in 1791. And so in a sense, he figured it out. But as many discoveries in biology go, or in the world in general, just because you figure something out doesn't mean that people are going to believe it. And people did not like this one. Right? People were not comfortable with the idea that electricity, something that was still sort of new, and that we understood was like part of lightning, you know, it's this weird static electricity build up. The idea that that was in your brain or in your bodies at all was really uncomfortable, right? People did not like it. In fact, one guy, he didn't like it so much that he invented a new type of thing to hold electricity because he wanted to disprove that it's true. And that was Volta, and he invented the battery because he didn't believe in animal electricity. So that's the battery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Galvani gave us a hint that people didn't believe him, and this persisted uh, for 70 more years, and it brings us to these two German scientists that did the experiment that really kind of cracks open and, and changed the way that we view the brain and neuroscience for our rapid. And then it partially the fall. And they're like, okay, well, we know that the brain controls behavior, right? No brain, no behavior. And, and so let's do a Galvani S experiment. And let's electrically stimulate the brain and ask if we can induce behavior, right? And if so, the brain must be electric. Just as Galvani said, if I electrically stimulate nerves and get a muscle contraction, the nerves must be electric. He's, he's asking the same thing with the brain. And so they actually performed this experiment on dogs, and they would they would um, drill a hole into the skull and they would put an electrode down and they would wander around the surface of the brain on, on uh, what's called their cortex. So the cortex is the outermost part of the brain that sheets the rest of the brain inside. So, you know, not knowing anything about the brain like we do now, there's no reason that if the brain did control behavior and it was electric, there's no reason that the cortex should be the site that does cause behavior, right? It's just the only reason they did this experiment on the cortex is because it's on the outside and they can't get through the cortex. It's hard to get it. But they were really lucky. It turns out that the outside of the brain, part of it, does control behavior. And so most of the places they put the electrode and these shock looked the dog they didn't see anything. But there was one area, this area, where if they touched the electrode there, they would see different muscle stretch. And this was huge. They found what we now know is called the motor cortex. Okay? And this was huge for like three fundamental reasons. One, they showed the brain was electric, right? They basically went one synapse up from Galvani and showed the brain had electricity in it. Two, 
they found the motor cortex, which is pretty cool. But three, they also, oh, yeah, so they went, yeah, my bad. <laughs> so they, they, he basically went to synapse up. Now we know the motor cortex neurons actually send axons to the spinal cord. So when you think about this now, it makes perfect sense. He was electrically stimulating here, which was exciting axons that synapse the spinal cord, which synapsed onto uh, motor neurons, which went to muscles. So he was just one synapse up from the down. And he was just, you know, cascading down the same, the same um, circuit of neurons that cause contraction of muscles. So this experiment was also fundamental because it was one of the first studies to show that different parts of the brain have different functions. And this was huge. At the time, people sort of viewed the brain as this one thing, and then sort of did all this stuff <laughs> together as one unit. And the idea that different parts of the brain can do different things was really new and controversial, right? And now we take it to be a fundamental truth. That's how we understand a lot of the brain, right? And so we've since, we've since subdivided the brain into many, many, many different functional units, right? We now know there's a premotor cortex that lies right here. It's involved in the time of behavior. We know that there's Broca's area, which is a type, uh, a, a part of the motor cortex, which specializes in our ability to form words and sentences and send signals to our vocal cords that allows us to control that. Right? There's a somatic sensory area right beside the motor cortex that allows us to feel things in our body. There's an auditory cortex, there's a visual cortex. There's many, many more here I'm not showing you. But basically, this experiment was the first of many, many more afterwards that let us realize that different parts of the brain are doing different things. Okay, but back to just behavior in the motor cortex. So we now know that uh, you know, there's this area of the brain and if you stimulate it, it's connected to the spinal cord and there are nerves in the spinal cord that control behavior. But, you know, it doesn't really tell us how the brain is controlling behavior, right? Like, what does it mean to be a neuron in here? What is it actually doing, right? This is something that the German scientists couldn't do because they didn't have the technology, right? All they could do was shock the brain and ask what happened. But to really move forward, we needed to be able to listen to it. Right? We need to be able to hear the electrical signal, to look at it and ask what the neurons are doing. So now we can do that with such precision, we can actually look at one, just the one single neuron and ask what it's doing. So I just want to show you an example of that. They've been doing this for many years, but this is an example um, from 2007, where they were recording from a single neuron in the monkey. And the monkey was just doing a simple reach task, where we reached over here and was asked to. And they have an electrode in the brain that is right up against one single neuron, and they're listening to the electrical activity of that neuron. And that data looks something like this. So this is for one time the monkey reached his hand. This is what they recorded. And the black bars are when the neuron is electrically active. Right? And the white space is when uh, the neuron is inactive. So you can think about the black, you can use ones and zeros that right? Laura was um, making an analogy to the binary code. This is sort of what you're seeing here, right? And now we can also overlay the behavior of the animal, which in this case they 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 uh, quantify looking at hand velocities, right? This is the monkey starting to move his hand as it's going the fastest and it's slowing to where to the target over here. And we can ask, okay, well, what is this neuron doing? relative to behavior. And if you look at one trial, I don't really know, right? You can't really see any pattern. But if you do this over and over again, in this case 17 times, and you look at the behavior, look at the, uh, the activity each time, they saw something like this. And now you can see a pattern, right? This neuron is definitely doing something that's correlated with the behavior, right? It's active at some basal level, and then it stops before the monkey starts moving his hand, and it's silent as the monkey kind of revs up his hand for the, for the movement. And then all of a sudden it becomes active again as the monkey is moving his hand fastest, and then as it slows down, so does the neuron. So this is really cool. It's just telling us, yeah, this neuron is involved in motor activity. It's involved in behavior. It's doing something. But not all, if you record it from another neuron, it's part of the brain, you might, have not, you might not be interested in doing something else you don't know about that has nothing to do with what this monkey is doing. But this neuron, this one in the motor cortex, is doing something. Now, what that something is, we still don't really know, right? Like, we don't really know where it's connected to or what part, what muscle group this is a part of or how it's actually generating behavior. We have a sense that these neurons are involved. 
So this is really exciting, but I should say that the future of figuring this stuff out isn't really reporting from one neuron, it's going to be reporting from lots of neurons. And trying to figure out what the circuit is doing all together um, to form behavior. And so just to give you a sense of what that looks like, I'm going to show you a really cool video, actually, of Laura. So it's not the motor cortex, but different part of the brain. It does something different. Um, but just to illustrate that we can collect data now where you can see activity from, from a single neuron with many, many side things. Okay? And so if we look, I'm going to circle a couple of these single neurons. And we play this movie, and basically when the neurons light up, that's when they're actually active. And it was something like this, right? The muscle is doing something, it's moving around, it's communicating. And you can see these incredibly, you know, complex activity patterns. And you can appreciate now that when you look at one neuron, you might be missing a lot of story. And it's hard to put together what the brain is doing by looking at one neuron. And, and so what a lot of people uh, do now is spend all the time staring at these data sets and trying to analyze them in ways that we can make sense of them and start to understand how our brain is computing things to, to not just perform behavior, but to do all the things that the brain does. And uh, these data sets are not easy to work with, and, and we still have a lot to learn. So, you know, just because we know that these neurons are full of behavior and we know their activity, you know, we can relate it somehow to behavior, we still don't really understand in a lot of cases what they're doing. All right, I told you guys the voluntary behavior occurs when neurons in the brain send signals to the spinal cord. But specific parts of the cortex contain neurons with activities for the motor behavior and the motor cortex. And advances in our ability to observe many neurons is very exciting, but there's still a lot that we don't know. And this is sort of like the beginning of this field of being able to find this kind of data. All right, are there any more questions before I go on to the last part? Yeah. Just real quick before you go on, that video that you were showing. Yeah. How was that taken? Spark, you know, what was it sensing? What was the yeah? So basically, uh, the neurons are expressing a protein that becomes fluorescent when there's electrical activity in the neuron. So it's a protein that, like, we engineered and put in the mouse. Yeah, wow. right. yeah it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so Laura's mouse is actually, well, I'll give you a brief answer, and it's going to have a lot more questions, but so then we can talk about it afterwards, or you can go ask a lot. Uh, but her mouse is actually uh, playing a video game. <laughs> and, and in the video game, it's going through maze, and she's studying how it decides where to go in the maze. And while it's going through the maze, she looks at this uh, part of her text, and try to figure out how the mouse is deciding where to go. Yeah. Yeah. How, like if you're looking at those those like the neurons turning on, like are you supposed to figure out what each one of those neurons is controlling? Yeah. Great question. I don't know. <laughs> 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 So the question is, you're collecting all this data, you can see the single neurons, how do you figure out what these neurons are actually control? And the answer is, that is the question that we're trying to answer. And we're hoping by collecting lots and lots of this data and analyzing it in, in intelligent ways, we can start to figure out that answer. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, my question applies to this case also, but just to make yeah. my question simpler. In the case of the single neuron in yeah. the right hand, yeah. Uh, you saw, you measure uh, the activity of the neuron as the uh, monkey movements happen. What happens now if you sit the monkey st still and you make one of those patterns in the, you, you induce one of those patterns in the neuron in the monkey? Then what happens with the baby? Yeah, so that's an incredible question. So, so the question is, you see, you record activities from the neuron while the monkey's in behavior or whatever animal. And um, you basically record that and you feed that activity back into the system yourself and ask, does it, what is the monkey going to do with that? And this is like something in neuroscience that we're just starting to be able to do now, right? Like what you said is a fantastic experiment and it's really hard to do, right? It's hard to both record and manipulate at once. And when you manipulate, it's hard to manipulate specific neurons in specific ways at once. 
And, and there are ways that we're getting around to doing this now, and there's this huge flow of optogenetics so you can control. This is we're measuring activity of flight, you can start to control neurons of flight. Um, but to control specific neurons that you saw active at a specific moment, that's still like, it's, it's, it's maybe just beyond our grasp right now. Yeah? Um, so, uh, we have below and Am well, I yeah. Okay. So in that example with the monkey reaching, yeah. the first time that that neuron fires in association with the reaching activity, does that happen on a conscious level or a subconscious level? It was hard to ask the monkey that. <laughs> 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 it's a great question. Uh, so the question is when when the when the neuron starts firing, firing when the neuron is active. Um, when it stops here, is that, is that the monkey doing something that you consciously think of or not? And the, and the answer is, uh, we don't know. We don't know what the monkey is thinking. But, um, but there are certainly parts of the brain that will, that will respond. We can see patterns of activity happening before the monkey starts to do anything. And in fact, even in, uh, in, in brain imaging studies in humans, you can see activity in parts of the brain before the, the human will allegedly know what they're going to do. And so there's, there's a disconnect between when you consciously think about knowing what you're going to do and when your brain is sending the signals to what you're going to do. It's, it's not perfectly correlated. So it gets into like a messy realm of like what's free will and all that. But it doesn't really, it doesn't really, it doesn't really attack any of that. It's all true. It's just happening at, at uh, time intervals that can be hard for us to, uh, to understand. Oh, sorry, wait, I'm going to go right here. Um, so this is kind of, you've talked a lot about like just like the basic actions. Yeah. Like when you, are you able to like actually like even touch where like emotions are or like recognize like this is the brain when it's happy? Yeah. I mean, so people have done this a lot um, using a, the type of technique that, that Laura showed in that last study looking at uh, cellos, uh, those functional fMRI studies. This is the only way that we can from lots of people, uh, it's, it's not invasive. Um, and we would love to do it in animals, and we try very hard, and a lot of people are really good at it, but it's just hard to know what the emotion of the animal is and what it's experiencing, and it's, it's really hard for us to interpret that data conclusions um, using the same techniques that we can use to uh, So, and then the techniques we have in humans aren't as good, we can't, you know, there's no way we can see single cells in humans right now using fMRI. FMRI is like, you know, lots of cells that we can see, they change the next um, so it's harder to study. Mm -hmm. Just following on that, what is the what is the resolution of fMRI? I mean, I know it, it's measuring blood. It's not measuring yeah. neural activity. It's measuring yeah. blood flow. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, sir. So fMRI, functional uh, MRI, is measuring blood flow to a certain region. And so you've got to jump a few series of logics to get that flow structure to be right. So increased blood flow means that there was an increase in, uh, in uh, metabolic activity, which you assume is because the neurons had to actively pump these targets in another bunch. Um, and so you correlate that with being active in the yeah. mm -hmm. In the uh, monkey experiment, you, you obviously pump the correct neuron for that correct muscle. Sure, yeah, that's why I put it in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, I think the, the, the guy's question over there is, how do you actually find that one? Right. And then if you had another monkey, just as hard to find that one, or? Yeah, yeah, so the question is, you know, how do you find this neuron that is for this behavior? And if you had another monkey, how do you find that same neuron again? And, and the question is, or the answer is, uh, well, that's the beauty of the motor cortex, that it gives you an area you can at least know that you should aim for. Uh, but they, they most definitely got lots of neurons that didn't correlate with the behavior. Right? It's not like all the neurons in this area are going to be below the behavior. And it's impossible to say that this neuron is the same neuron as is a neuron in another monkey by like anatomy. But you could classify uh, types of neurons that behave similarly between atoms. So, you know, there might be this, this type of behavior from the neuron, you might find a subset of animals and say, okay, there's this type of neuron that's doing this. We don't know what it is yet, but we can see in a lot of animals, so it must be important, right? And so, then this pause, for them, it must be doing something functionally important because if you look at 
lots of monkeys, which you can't really do, but say it's in mice, so you have lots of mice, um, and see that this is conserved, and so we think it has an important concentration. So is it a specific neuron, or is it a group of neurons in an area? Well, this neuron is, is, is just like, we were just happy to recording from, from one of these neurons, right? There's, uh, the system is going to be just as active as in here. So you just happen to put your electrode behind uh, by this neuron, for example. And so you're missing all the rest of the information. Um, yeah, that's okay. okay. All right, then we're going to move on to the last part. Um, and and that, I'm going to move away from cortex for a second. So I think it would be remiss of me as a, as a scientist, I'm left with the impression that the cortex is the be-all and end-all of the brain and the mastermind of all behavior. There's actually a lot going on underneath the cortex. As you can see here, there's like a ton of brain structures that, are, that exist within the cortex, and a lot of them are doing really, really important things. Uh, even like high-level cognitive things that we often attribute to being part of this like cortex and the scheme structure. Okay, so the part I'm going to talk about today is called the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia uh, can be sort of simply defined as a collection of subcortical structures that play an important role in uh, controlling voluntary movements, habits, and reward. <clears throat> okay, so to be a little more explicit about how important this brain structure is to doing these things, I just made a little list of what can go wrong when your basal ganglia isn't functioning the right way. Right, and it can cause a lot of things. So it's the site of Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. It's the site of outflation and drug addiction. Uh, and, it's, and, it's, and it's dysregulation is correlated with a lot of things, including ADHD, OCD, um, emotional control, and depression. Okay, so it obviously has a profound capability of modulating the behavior of these. So how do they do this? Well, I told you guys that the motor cortex sends a big connection out to the spinal cord, where you control neurons or control muscles. But what I didn't tell you is that it also sends a huge connection to the basal ganglia. This basal ganglia, in turn, provides a big input back to the motor cortex, modulating or changing, influencing what activity actually comes up. So the basal ganglia is actually a huge feedback loop from cortex back to cortex, it changes the information that eventually leaves the brain and goes to the spinal cord. But the basal ganglia doesn't just get information from the motor cortex. It gets information from lots of places. So we just do this a little bit differently here. It also takes information regarding our sensory, uh, our sensory state, finding an, finding an organization, memory, emotional state, motivational state, and reward. And the basal ganglia is taking inputs of all this kind of information and integrating them and using it to inform what kind of behavior we do. And so the way we think about motor cortex and basal ganglia now, I think is more that the motor cortex is generating a bunch of ideas for behavior. Okay? And the basal ganglia is taking these ideas and it's integrating all this other information about your state, your emotional state, your motivation, uh, what environment you're in, and selecting one of those ideas. And that's the behavior you actually do. So it's a gateway to behavior, right? It's stopping most of the ideas from cortex, and it's letting one through, and then one through is the one you actually do. This is very useful, right? I mean, this is incredibly useful. So you can think, I mean, to, to, to sort of say like a overly simplified Example, if one of you in the crowd right now is like really hungry and there's a bag of chips in your bag, you don't just eat it because there's like all this stuff that's like, well, like it's gonna make a lot of noise. And I remember the last time someone did that at a lecture and I was really annoyed with them, and so maybe I'm gonna wait and I'm like suppressing my hunger until later time. So basically I can suppress that right? I mean this is only simplified, but it starts to get at how much information you really need to take in to decide what kind of stuff. You, uh, what kind of behaviors are actually going to choose? Um, okay, so to just give you guys a sense of how processing information, how changing the way the basal ganglia processes this information, can profoundly change the way you behave, I'm just going to give a couple of examples using one neuromodulator, one type of neurotransmitter that can modulate how information is processed. And it's the reward one. You guys know what this one is? Dopamine. Dopamine. Yeah. So dopamine 
plays a huge role in how the basic identity of functions. If you look at a distribution of like where dopamine receptors are in the brain, uh, a hot spot is the basic angle. It's doing most of this work there. So what's dopamine doing to the basic angle? Well, it's rewarding, it's reinforcing. And so what it does is it reinforces the behavior that you're doing, right? It's, it's providing feedback saying, I like that, do that again, get better at that, select that one if I'm given that uh, set of ideas again. And this is really, really great. This allows us to learn a lot of complicated motor patterns by just reinforcing them. So, you know, if you are learning how to ride a bike, or learning how to catch a ball, or learning how to play an instrument, right? You get these feedbacks that they give you dopamine, right? You caught the ball, that felt good, you get dopamine. You, uh, you didn't fall off your bike, that felt good, you get dopamine. You played the right notes, uh, and your auditory information gives you uh, feedback, and that produces dopamine, and that reinforces whatever you did and makes it more likely that you do it the same way next time, right? This is a great way to learn how to do more. But as you can also imagine, if it's at the wrong time and too much, it can be really bad, right? And that's basically what addiction is, right? It's learning something too well, and that learning something happens to be something that's generally bad, right? So um, when you're addicted to a drug or you're addicted to a TV show or a type of food, it's all really the same type of addiction. It's just dopamine being released sort of at the wrong time when we, the wrong being like the socially wrong time, right? And reinforcing that behavior, it's not wrong, it's not like the basal ganglia is not working, it's actually working perfectly. We're just, we're just making it work at the wrong time, right? And it reinforces that behavior to cause, in the end, addiction. Uh, it reinforces that behavior so that you do it again and again and again. Well, what happens if you have no dopamine? Well, it turns out that you need a little bit of dopamine in the basic ganglia to select any behavior, okay? It needs a little bit just to allow, to, to the basal ganglia to allow one behavior through, to select one, it needs a little bit of dopamine to get the system going, okay? And so if you don't have any dopamine, it's really hard for the basal ganglia to choose any behavior. And this is exactly what we see in Parkinson's patients. So Parkinson's disease happens when a subset of your dopamine neurons that innervate your basal ganglia, they die. And so your basal ganglia doesn't get the dopamine that it seeks to get. And it makes the basal ganglia unable to, to let behaviors through that can be exhibited. So it just stops all the ideas from motor cortex instead of choosing one. And this is why, I mean, not completely, like incompletely, but it stops it you know, more often than it stops for, for you and I. And so, this is why in a Parkinson's patient, they have trouble like reaching for a glass of water. They know they want to reach a glass of water. They know how to do it. They've done it a ton of times before. But the basal ganglia is stopping them from doing it. It's not letting that idea through the long view. And that's why they have a hard time initiating that movement. And they can't overcome it, um, but it, it becomes much more difficult. All right. So, introducing the basal ganglia, I use this idea that the cortex is really an idea generator of behavior. But the basal ganglia filters these ideas and picks the best one that it thinks there is and feeds this back to the cortex. And then changing how the basal ganglia filters these ideas can profoundly change behavior. And so, before I finish, um, I just wanted to, to give like a final thought about this lecture of perception and behavior. I kind of comment that both Laura and I, we started in the, in the periphery, right? We started there because it's the simplest thing to understand, and it's the easiest often to access. The real question, you know, is how we get in the periphery, a sensation, back to the periphery as a behavior. And we made a lot of really great strides, right? We worked with the brain's electric, we can now report to many four possible neurons at once. And there are a lot of things that we figured out. We've learned that you know it's not magical. It's not magic, right? Like we, we figured out what the units are, and we're trying to put it together. So the future of, of, of neuroscience, this capacity is really trying to understand how the brain takes in information and creates representation and how it takes that and makes decisions and sends that back out to the periphery to make the data. And with that, I'll finish and thank the organization and take uh, any questions you guys might have. You just
described the basal ganglia as the decider. So, so yeah. the, the cortex proposes a hypothesis and it, it chooses. Right. Um, is it also correct to say it's, it's the unconscious chooses? And there are other areas of the cortex, particularly the frontal cortex, right. that can inhibit and override that choice. Yeah. So I, think that's, like to be I think that's a fair. So the question is, I uh, described the visual ganglia as some of the side. And is it fair to say that it's more the involuntary involuntary desire? Or the other parts of the cortex. Or the, the less cortex. conscious desire. Less conscious, right? And there are other parts of, of cortex or of the brain that are involved in more consciousness. I think that's a really fair way to look at it. I think the basal ganglia, in some sense, takes care of a lot of, of the choices that we make that aren't conscious of voluntary. So maybe the bad chips explanation wasn't the best one because you're consciously thinking about all of that. Um, and there are definitely lots of areas in prefrontal cortex and in different parts that we think are involved in sort of more executive function decision making. They may also send a strong projection to the basal ganglia, so we get some information as well. But um, you know it controls a lot of decisions that we, I think, think are conscious. And so it, I think it's very much a continuum and not like a, this is unconscious. Yeah, where is it located? Yeah, so it's located like in the middle of your brain, underneath your cortex. And what I'm showing you here in red is, is actually just one of the parts of the basal ganglia. This, the biggest part, uh, which is the, it's called the striatum. It's actually the input nucleus of the basal ganglion. So you can see here you have one on each hemisphere. And it sits underneath the cortex, kind of right in the middle. And for you guys that know uh, some of the emotional parts of your brain, that amygdala is actually this ball that's hanging off the striatum. Yeah. What happened when uh, like poke at, like you poke at question and you don't want to do it or obsessive compulsion? Like you clean too much or you don't want to. Yeah, so I think that's again a case. So the question is, you know, what happens when you have a case like obsessive compulsive order when you when you clean compulsively? You said even if you don't want to clean. No, versus like how the brain, uh, is it the dopamine level that um, like some people would clean so much and others would don't want to do it? Yeah, so I want to be careful not to like overly simplify and make it seem as though all of OCD is just because dopamine is changing over the reason it works. But I feel safe in saying that it's certainly a part of how it works. And that, you know, people who experience that, basically the dopamine is reinforcing that behavior a lot more than it would other people. And so, you know, their state that the, the way that their brain then responds to the, the idea of clean is very different than someone else to respond to that. And so they feel an impulse much more strongly to clean. And that, in part, is from them getting a lot more dopamine when someone else wouldn't get dopamine at the thought of cleaning or having something new. Yeah. Let's see. The whole point about the neurotransmitters is that we're allowing the cells to overcode some type of ion channel to become more positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's really only two kinds of electricity to mm -hmm. positive and negative. Yeah. And so you have all these different neurotransmitters. And fundamentally, the only thing they're doing is making individual cells active or inactive. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem logical that they would have radically, radically different effects. Oh, you can't just open the panel by some of the means that I mean. I don't know what I'm asking. <laughs> 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 well, that's a great question. Let me, let me try to ask a question for you. Which is that you know, the brain is a very complex
So glutamate and GABA, I mean, glutamate is the main excitatory neurotransmitter, and GABA is the main inflammatory neurotransmitter. They're what are called ionotropic receptors, or ionotropic uh, neurotransmitters. They were not to say. We classify what they are based on the receptor, not the neurotransmitter. So there are ionotropic receptors, and they are the kinds we talked to you about, and they let ions through when they're bound, and they cause an electrical signal. But there's also another class called metabolites. And they don't open pores, but they just start a signaling cascade that can do a multitude of things in their cell. They can make it generally more excitable or less excitable. They can make it fun learn thing or different things. They can cause a synthesis of different proteins. They can change the way your DNA reacts to something. They can do anything you can imagine. And serotonin and dopamine, they act on these metabotropic receptors. And so they do things that are much more complicated than opening and closing ion Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is serotonin? Like, what do you do? What is serotonin? So serotonin is another neurotransmitter that binds with receptors, and it's often, uh, you know, plays a really important role in mood, generally, like, and, like uh, affect and personality. Um, and these are just like really broad stroke answers, right? But uh, the question of how it does that is, is the one that's really actively researched right now. We, can, we don't actually know, you know exactly how that works. We know it acts in certain brain regions, and we know that people who have low serotonin feel differently, people have high serotonin. We're using this information to try to figure out what that means and how it's different. Yeah, endorphins. What are the endorphins? Yeah, so endorphins are a different type of neurotransmitter. Um, also of this metabotropic kind. And, and they, uh, they can exist in your periphery and they can cause, uh, they're, they're an analgesic, so they can cause decreases in pain sensation. They can also cause something very much dopamine like that reward. So an endorphin can be an opioid in your brain, for example. Your brain produces natural uh, opioids. Right? Um, and they are just a different class of metabotropic. So it was naturally trained to the point of pain. The endorphins make it possible to do not respond to the, to the pain and just fight through it. So, so I think I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, I think whenever you exercise, there's a certain amount of endorphins that are released, um, and this can be beneficial in that it makes you less responsive to pain. But um, it's not so that the athletes are better at this. Than there are a lot more complicated reasons why they kind of break through the wall and all that kind of thing. But uh, that's, those are the endorphins in the previous Yeah. All right, maybe like two more questions down here. I'm wondering how big, like, the world Yeah. 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 How the neurotypic gives you the AD electrical impulse, right? So how does that figure into uh, changing behavior? I know it's just one of those like. So, so what do you mean by inducing electrical impulse? Yeah, like the, like a, a, a Oh, like the shrewd like, parties and stuff. Yeah, like right? you're using some like deep brain stimulation or something. Right, like, like the stimulation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean. This is again one of those things that uh, it works generally well, and we're just trying to figure out why it works too well. It certainly wasn't invented because we were like, oh, they need this. It was invented the other way around. We were like, oh, this works. And so, I mean, that's how a lot of drugs work, right? There's most drugs aren't designed intelligently. Or, or, <laughs> I mean, I mean intelligently, like, uh, you, know, you, know, uh, you just find a drug and it happens to work, and people spend a lot of time figuring out. Wow. So I think that key brain stimulation is a bit similar to that. It's now that um, stimulating parts of the brain, you know, maybe what you're doing is you're getting to that part of the brain where uh, you have some dopamine cells up over and you're stimulating those and you're pumping out more dopamine and it's helping improve Parkinson's disease, uh, Parkinson's patients, uh, something, uh, their, their symptoms. But uh, it's definitely not well understood. I mean, it's understood that it's increasing activity of a certain brain region, but it's not always well understood why that's improving some. All right. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to say, which kind of relates to her. <clears throat> I work in neuro rehab, mm -hmm. so basically, I want to tell you that what basic neuroscientists do 
we take that and we see patients and we apply basic neuroscience and we do our own research about behaviors to find out why a, you know brain stimulation works or why um, like Laura had mentioned how experience changes the brain and so the whole thing in rehabilitation now is it's not exercise and whatever it's providing an enriched environment and having experiences rewire the brain so we take basic neuroscience that you come up with and we take it and we try and apply it and so the answer to those questions can be you know uh, so complicated or even in drugs. I mean, I was just mentioning that they're using a drug in head injury for headaches and um, and for PTSD for nightmares, and it's a blood pressure medication, mm -hmm. and it's working right. to resolve. So, why is a blood pressure medication helping resolve uh, post-concussive symptoms? I mean, right. so it's all know. trial and error, and it's yeah. taking basic neuroscience and applying it to like the people that walk in your office. Right. Yeah, no. And go the other way too, right? You can discover something like, oh my goodness, people with you know, blood, blood pressure medication are experiencing lots of these symptoms. Right. And then basic science will be like, right. And they, you know, know, right. right. Or they use stuff. like gabapentin, which is a seizure medication yeah. for pain. I mean, right. yeah, exactly. so it all. Yeah. It, so I mean, there's definitely not a specific roadmap for discovering that. Use. All right, guys, thank you very much.